Sri Lanka says it's defaulting on all its foreign debt. The island nation is seeing its worst economic crisis in decades and growing public anger. But what does this move mean? And will there be political fallout? This is Inside Story. Welcome to the program. I'm Dedi Nabugeda. The economic crisis in Sri Lanka appears to be getting worse by the day. Its government has been forced to default on its entire $51 billion of external debt. There's been a shortage of food, fuel, and schools have had to cancel exams for a lack of paper. It's all led to weeks of anti-government protests culminating in calls for President Gotabaya Rajapaksa to resign. We'll bring in our guests in a moment, but first, Manel Fernandez reports from Colombo. This, the Colombo sort of hub, is teeming. You can see stalls selling sarongs uh, and people uh, sort of taking a look here. Another food shop where people are trying to buy some treats for the new year. But a reminder down here of what the situation is. A generator, just to keep things running for the power uh, because many, many people are suffering with power cuts. Just one of the issues, that's the reality of the economic crisis that Sri Lanka is going through. And we're just hearing from the government that they have decided in the interim to stop debt repayments in the process of going to the IMF. They will be looking to restructure their debt. So that announcement has come today. Some economists say this is far too late in the coming. They've been asking for it for months and months, and the government insisted that it was in control. But now deciding to put a halt in the interim and consensually restructure debt. Everything has gone up in price. I came to buy clothes, but they are so expensive. The question is, is it enough? For months and months, economists, opposition politicians, have been asking the government to put a hold on its debt repayments, to negotiate a sort of a planned default, uh, and meanwhile to save the precious foreign currency, which is so, so depleted. And that's what's led to all of these shortages, fuel, cooking gas, food items, medicine. And that is what uh, has been the rallying cry to the government. So what does it mean for Sri Lanka to default on its external debt? Well, it happens when a borrower fails to pay an international loan at the time it's due. Sri Lanka's usable foreign currency reserves have plunged below a billion dollars, limiting its ability to repay loans. A default can lead to lower credit scores, reducing the chances of obtaining credit in the future and higher interest rates on existing as well as new loans. To discuss this, uh, let's bring in our guest. Joining us from Colombo is Juhan Pereira, who is the executive director of the National Peace Council of Sri Lanka. In Jaffna, Ahilan Kadir Gamar, who is a political economist and senior lecturer at the University of Jaffna in Sri Lanka as well. And joining us from Melbourne is Amanta Pereira, a researcher at the School of Education and the Arts at CQ University, Australia. Welcome to you all. Thanks for joining us on Inside Story. Ahilan, uh, over to you first. So. Now that Sri Lanka has announced it is, in fact, defaulting on its foreign debts, does this stop the do downward spiral? Yeah, it's, it's to be seen how the markets are going to uh, react to this. Um, this is unprecedented. Sri Lanka has never defaulted on its um, external loans. Um, this might uh, start a spiral of you know, difficulties in um, uh, uh, gaining credit in the international markets, it might um, lead to even difficulties in financial transactions uh, globally. Uh, the, the question is also why it had to come about at this point. Um, the government had plenty of time over the last few years to try to shore up its foreign reserves. In fact, last year, it had its highest import bill amounting to 21 billion US dollars. So rather than saving some of that foreign earnings or foreign exchange towards a situation like this, they continue to spend. The other question is that Sri Lanka is going for negotiations with the uh, IMF next week. Why did they have to default just a week ahead of going to negotiations with IMF? 
Does that reduce the bargaining power that Sri Lanka has in terms of reducing the conditionalities from the IMF? So a lot of questions and a lot of uh, about this whole process, as well as what implications there are going to be. Right. They, so they claim that with the IMF support, they'll be able to repay uh, these loans. But if they are unable to reach an agreement, and, and what would be the the consequences for the people would right. be austerity. Right. Left come out All the important points. All important points. In fact, as part of our discussion, let me just bring in Colombo uh, for the time being and Jahan Pereira. So, if this IMF program actually goes ahead, it would be Sri Lanka's 17th financial rescue package from the global lender. And as our guest from Jaffna was saying, it does come with strings and conditions attached. I mean, why is this IMF loan going to work when the country has already had 16 in the past, in your opinion? And the significance of this uh, default is that uh, Sri Lanka's uh, currency also has been precipitously falling. It has uh, fallen by like close on 100% in the last two months. And uh, we are also uh, going to countries, uh, foreign countries such as India, Bangladesh, China, asking for loans for, to just tide over the next month. So in a sense, the, the government taking this action of uh, trying to preserve whatever uh, foreign exchange it has by not repaying the debt is, uh, is to the people, it, it will be something that they will welcome because uh, they, they, they do want the petrol, the diesel. There are huge queues, lines uh, uh, stretching for a kilometer or more uh, every day. People stay overnight in, in these gas, at these gas stations waiting to fill their vehicles, their tractors, their combined harvesters, because they can't even do their farming properly. So for people, the, that the, the importance is that the government should have money to import the essentials. There's no medicine now in the, in the hospital. The government has denied it, but the doctors say that there isn't medicine in, in, the, in the hospitals. So... Uh, Yes. So, so what you're saying is this is a good move. Past. So so what you're saying is this is a good move on behalf of the government to show the people that they're actually doing something. Well, I mean it's it's a double-edged sword. But up till now, the government was not doing anything. Now at least they have taken some decisive step. They they appointed a new central bank governor. The early the earlier person was saying that no, don't worry, we will somehow get the money. We will repay our debt. We will manage within the country. Now we have got a new person who has also uh, increased the interest rates very considerably because that's the way to, I think, uh, restore some confidence in people to, to at least save the money. They have, they have been printing money. Also. They've been printing enormous amounts of rupees these, these last few months. And that also has contributed to the downward spiral. So it's in a, in a context of very bad economic management. Now we have this decision. Okay. And so, I mean... Okay, let me bring in Amanta from Melbourne. I mean, um, what do you think uh, about the, the IMF loan if it goes ahead? Is this going to be uh, good enough for the people, Amanta? Because as, as we've been hearing, I mean, the IMF loans come with painful policies. The people have already been feeling a lot of pain on the streets. We've seen the protests taking place. So how will Sri Lankans be reacting to this news, do you think? Well, I think how Sri Lankans react to this news will depend on the very fact whether these loans or these negotiations are going to be felt on the ground. Because what we are seeing uh, is something that is really unprecedented. There are power cuts, there are fuel shortages, there are gas shortages, there are spiraling uh, price hikes. So all these things uh, have come together and they are felt by every citizen. So whether this is going, these loans, these negotiations with the IMF and with uh, individual countries, whether they're going to really make an impact is whether these shortages are going to uh, be reversed in any way. If the power cuts are going to become shorter, if the gas uh, lines are, are going to be shorter, if people can find fuel without staying in line for, a uh, half a day or even more. I think that's uh, what's going to change the mood on the ground because these protests that we are seeing, they have come about because people, everyone in Sri Lanka, except for a very, very small minority, are feeling 
uh, the impact of the economic crisis. Uh, you cannot go through a day when there is a 13-hour power cut. Right. And then you can't... So it's, it's going to depend on whether all these negotiations, all these loans are going to be felt by the people okay, who are Okay, let's protesting. take a step back for a moment before we look at how this is all impacting uh, the, the Rajapaksa family. But Ahilan, just tell us what's caused this economic crisis and whether uh, it can be sort of pinpointed at one thing or is it, is it several things over the years? It's um, several things over the years. Um, definitely the war in Ukraine and the, the rising commodity prices that increased our import bill. The pandemic and the disruption of our tourism sector has been has had its impact. But really, this is a long drawn crisis where Sri Lanka has been bidding beyond its means. We've been floating these sovereign bonds in, in, in the capital markets and our debt stock is extremely high. So that's the question that even this IMF agreement that we are in the process already, I would argue, even if we haven't signed, because we are already uh, implementing many of the recommendations of the IMF. But whether that's only going to continue to increase our debt stock or how are we going to address this issue, first without restricting imports, because our foreign exchange is limited. If you look at the measures that have been taken already, which are in the, the, the last IMF report that came out on March 25th, we have already floated our exchange rate, but that uh, depreciation is borne by the people. They have to pay 50% more for imported items. They have increased interest rates, a lot of businesses are going to go bankrupt because if you have doubled the interest rates, they won't have working capital. Now, as the IMF recommended, we are going into restructuring with a default, but that puts us at the mercy of the IMF. Right, we but let me ask you this. I mean, what more could the government have done? What more could the government have done, Ahilan? Because as you were just saying, there's a rising, uh, we saw the rise in the cost of fuel, the coronavirus lockdown. As a result, there was a drop in tourism. So there were a lot of external factors that battered Sri Lanka. Exactly. So the, the first thing the government should have done is to all along prioritize essential goods. Only so late in the day have they, are they now talking about prioritizing essential goods and even defaulting on a loan. But as I mentioned, the last year, we had a peak amount of imports of all kinds of luxury items. They need to have a public distribution system. All of that was dismantled when Sri Lanka went through structural adjustment with the IMF back in 77, 78. Even though we've gone through 16 IMF agreements, this one is going to be as consequential as when we opened up our economy in 77, 78. And since then, inequalities have grown. Development has been only around Colombo. And these protests that are coming out is the reality of reaction against such inequalities in our country and, and, and the disruption of their services. But with these reforms that are likely to take place, my worry is that the burden is again going to be put on the working people. Okay. Uh, Jehan, do you agree with uh, what's being said from uh, Jaffna? And also, you know, we've seen much of the anger recently uh, expressed in terms of protests and such directed at the Rajapaksa family of course, has, who's been in power for, for decades. So the criticism is that the government failed to take basic steps and there were warning signs. Is that something that you agree with? Yes, I, I'd like to add uh, two further points to what Ahilan said. And the first is that, as Ahilan said, we were living beyond our means. You know, we fought, we had a war in our country for three decades and a lot of money was invested in the war. There was a lot of destruction also that took place. But we did not really suffer a, a, a reduction in our living standards as we saw it. And maybe we didn't develop as fast as other countries did. But we also, our living standards did not drop. They also rose. And how did they rise? Because we took these loans. We took these loans uh, first from institutional lenders, then from the private sector, the commercial lenders. And we lived beyond our means. That's one thing that we need to keep in mind. The second thing is that the people are really... I mean, they are really what they are focusing on is what the Rajapaksas have done. There is a belief that the Rajapaksas have taken the money, that they have stolen this money, and that they were the main, main people behind. Of course, we, we know that not only the Rajapaksas, but the entire political system has got extremely corrupt. And we, we have known for a long time that there were commissions being taken by, by politicians. We know, for instance, that there are 
there are such huge investments that have been made, especially taken with the Chinese loans. We have the tallest building in South Asia, a tower, which is, which is empty, which has not been functional for the last several years. We have an airport in the south of the country, which is the Rajapaksa's stronghold, where they, they, are, they are electoral seat, uh, which, is, which is hardly having any planes coming. We have a port that, to which we expected thousands of ships to come, or we were promised, and only a few, uh, 50 or 60 uh, ships come, which we have now had to lease to the Chinese for 99 years. Right. So it is this issue of corruption, lack of accountability, that people are now blaming the Rajapaksa. They're focusing on the Rajapaksa and they want them to go because they think that they are the ones who have done this damage, but it's not only the Rajapaksa. In fact, I think the entire government, in, and that is in a way reflected in what the people are saying, the protesters are saying, they're saying we want all 225 MPs to go. Okay. Of course, this, this is an exaggeration on their part, but they really mean is they want the corrupt MPs to go. Okay, Amanta, is this something that uh, the president himself uh, can survive? He, he's called for uh, talks with protesters. Uh, is that likely to appease them at all? Well, I mean, uh, the reaction from the protesters, uh, in fact, it was the prime minister who wrote, wrote an open letter saying that he would like to open discussions and dialogue with the protesters. And the protesters have quickly, or at least uh, some of the protesters have quickly reacted to say, we're not going to talk unless our demands, which is that the president resigns and all the Rajapaksas in government relinquish their post. So you, the, the anger of the protesters are directed at the Rajapaksa family. Now, one thing that we need to understand is that the Gotabe Rajapaksa administration, when it came into power, it actually promised a change. Its slogan was system change. What it said was we were going to change the system that has been in place, uh, which people said was corrupt, uh, which didn't deliver equally to all Sri Lankans. So they came on the platform that they were going to deliver, they were going to change the system. And instead, what has happened is, instead of any kind of improvement, things have regressed uh, than anyone has ever seen in their lifetime. So what we are seeing is the anger boiling over and the Rajapaksas have become the target because for the better part of the last two decades, they have been the most powerful political clan in Sri Lanka. So right. they've okay, but look, I mean, the opposition, the opposition, Amanta, is also pouncing on this. They are uh, hoping to hold some sort of no-confidence vote, but the opposition has also weakened. I mean, they don't have a majority. They haven't been able to uh, take control of parliament. So what do they do? Well, I think... The, the, the real interesting thing in this protest is that these protests uh, are taking place without a, without, uh, without a political party or the politician or the political structure uh, guiding them or giving them momentum. So the opposition cannot uh, expect to gain power or to form a government through this protest, because uh, the protesters are in fact saying that they want this whole system changed, but for starters, they want the government that is in place to change so that some decisions could be made that uh, the prevalent situation can be changed. So it's a quite a unique situation that is happening in Sri Lanka, because what we've seen in the past is that protest most certainly not this large, uh, have always been led by a politician, a political party, or at least a political slogan. Now here, these protests are organic. People are pouring onto the streets without being prompted by politicians. Right. So it will be very difficult for one political party to gain uh, momentum from this, but it most certainly uh, will mean that one political power family would be at the receiving end of this. But Ahila, and I mean, how challenging is it going to be to dismantle this deep-rooted corruption in the system as what's being described by uh, my guest from Colombo, Johan Pereira? Yeah, of course there is um, corruption and, and um, extraction by this regime and, and, and the anger on the streets reflects that. But the crisis itself has also been the consequence of the economic trajectory that we've been on. 
um, the kind of investment that Jahan talked about, investment in infrastructure. But these are the programs that many of Sri Lanka's donors have also been recommended, whether it's the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank. And with this IMF agreement, the question is whether are we going to continue in that same direction? We put all our eggs in the tourism basket. And is that the kind of economy we want, we want to build? Sri Lanka is now going through a food crisis. Agriculture and the food system has been neglected for decades. So there needs to be a real shift in the trajectory of our uh, economic policies. And would that happen along with this change? This is the kind of a crisis that's bound to bring about major political and economic changes, whether we like it or not. At the moment, the anger is against the Rajapaksas. They've been completely delegitimized. President Gotabaya Rajapaksa, whether he likes it or not, is, is going to have to go sooner or later. I think that's clear. But what would come after that? With If it's similar to what happened in 1977, an IMF agreement that leads to further suffering of the people, we might see again a swing to the right. We might even have a worse fascist regime that emerges if we don't actually satisfy the needs of the people. Because people have gone through much over the last couple of years, the pandemic, the current economic crisis. So their relief should be foremost. And my worry is that the current trajectory with the IMF agreement is, is going to bring about more suffering and then give space for other kinds of uh, repressive political or populist political actors to emerge rather than set Sri Lanka on the path of democracy. Right. Okay. Uh, Jahan, I mean, we've spoken about the, uh, the protests and people coming out, but you're in Colombo. Just give us a real sense of what life is like today for ordinary Sri Lankans who are trying to make ends meet. The situation today, uh, today is a holiday here. It's a, it's a new year. We are just approaching our traditional new year. It will be very quiet usually, but in the, in the area near the presidential secretary, there are lots of people, there are lots of young people. And in a way they have made it uh, a sort of like a festival of, uh, of democracy. They're talking democracy, they're talking about ideas, they're they are doing skits and they're keeping their spirits up because it's also raining. It's raining very heavily in Palambo. Uh, but as for the rest of the uh, population, uh, they are actually, they're, they're not traveling. Now, most of, most of us during this period, we want to travel back to our villages and we don't want, and we can't do that because there are no buses and there are, I mean, there's a shortage of diesel to, to fuel the buses. So many people are just staying in their homes. And of course, they're going shopping. They're going doing their shopping. But as we saw in the, in the, in the uh, footage earlier, the, the prices have risen tremendously. So people are really suffering. And uh, at the moment, uh, it's, it's the poorer people who are, who are paying the price. But uh, because they're they they, they reducing their in, uh, food intake, for instance, but uh, later on, it's going to come, it's going to hit uh, the others also. It's also hitting us in the sense that of these power cuts, which are, which are very unbearable. What do you think is going to happen next? How, how is this going to play out, in your opinion? Yeah, my, my hope is this: that see what we would like, what I would like, is to see the change occur through the democratic system, through the constitution, and for that, it requires that the parliamentary majority should shift already. 40 members of the of the ruling of the government have opted to become independents, uh, but they may still be aligned to the government. But when they see that this, these protests are not stopping, and they see the widespread nature of, of the of the desire for a change in the leadership, that they will shift. And as a, as a consequence of that shift, what I would like to see, because the president is not going at the moment, what I would like to see is a constitutional amendment brought in, uh, brought, uh, uh, bringing back constitutional amendment we had, which was overridden by this president. Right. He, as soon as he came to power, he came with the 20th amendment, which concentrated power in himself and eroded the independence of the judiciary and other institutions like the public service. I would like to see that uh, amendment repealed. Okay. That will pave the way. For, for reform in the future. Thank you so much. We'll have to leave it there on that note. Thank you for joining us. Jahan Pereira, Ahilan Kadirgamar, and Amanta Pereira, thanks so much. Thank you for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. For further discussion, you can go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Insight Story. 
You can join the conversation on Twitter as well. Our handle is AJ Inside Story for myself and the entire team here in Doha. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye for now.